Mm. Hadn't thought of this. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Wherever you are this day, you are welcome. And no matter how far we wander from you, O oh God, your steadfast love finds us. No matter how unjust the world seems to us, O oh God, your steadfast righteousness sustains us. No matter how vulnerable our lives seem to us, O oh God, your steadfast presence gives us hope. No matter how unloved and uncared for we feel, O oh God, you hear our cries and answer our prayers. Let us pray. Your love, O oh God, is, is, as, as, is, is as immeasurable as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches higher than the clouds in the sky. Your justice is like the majestic mountains, firm and unshakable. And your judgments are as deep as the ocean depths. And yet, in your greatness, you care for all creation, people and animals alike. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds rest in your presence. We eat and are satisfied at your table. We drink from the river of your overflowing kindness. For you alone can quench our thirst. You alone can open our eyes and awaken our souls. May your love continue to grow deeply in the lives of all who know you. May your salvation come to all who follow in your paths. Receive our worship as a sign of our love for you. Amen. So let us stand and sing. Crown him with many crowns.
Before you sit down, before you sit down, let us share God's peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In a socially distantly responsible way, let us share God's peace. For those who are young and for those who are young at heart, which I think includes all of us. So weddings are fun, aren't they? It's fun to see the, the happy couple get married and usually there's a party afterwards. Maybe if you haven't been to a wedding, you might have seen one on, on television. But sometimes not everything goes to plan in weddings. And nearly 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on earth, he attended a wedding that had run out of wine. Jesus' mum told him about it and, and Jesus got the servants to fill up six large jars with water. Each jar held between 20 and 30 gallons. It doesn't sound very much, but when you think about it, that's around 70 to 110 litres per jar. Here's a, a two-litre bottle of milk. So it contains about eight glasses of milk. Good glasses, but eight glasses of milk. It said each jar held between... 37 and 55 two litre bottles. That's equivalent to around 400 glasses of milk. It's a lot of milk, isn't it? But there were six jars. That's over 300, 200 litre bottles of milk, which is around 2,400 glasses of milk. Now we could wait the time it takes for that to fill up the whole thing. We could jump ahead. That much milk. It's a lot of milk, isn't it? But we're not talking about milk. Jesus turned the ordinary water into wine. And not just any wine, but the best wine. That's a lot of wine, isn't it? So what can we learn about this then? Well, Jesus can do what seems, turn the, what seems ordinary into something that's extraordinary. Jesus does that in our lives as well, turns something that's ordinary into extraordinary. And Jesus gives us the passion and the skills to be able to do that. Here's some examples. People who are able to do this are, are amazing, who can turn ordinary ingredients into amazing meals. Fruits and vegetables and meats and, and spices and, and all the things that go there into an amazing meal. 
That's, that's turning the ordinary into the extraordinary, isn't it? I know people are able to do this as well. You could turn pieces of wood into amazing sculptures or furniture or, or other things. I know there's a lot of people in this congregation who can do this as well. Turn ordinary bits of material into amazing quilts and tapestries. And I'm sure there's even more of these types of people in who are able to knit and turn um, just yarns of, of, of wool into clothing. How incredible is that? Turn the, the ordinary into the extraordinary. And we can share what we make with people who are in need. And I know there are knitters groups, for example, around Brisbane, and even probably here in this church too, who are able to turn knitted wool into beanies, which can then go to people who are in need. People make clothing for, for those in need in the Philippines out of just ordinary materials and wool. And, and it's just incredible what we're able to do, turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. And Jesus gives us the skills to be able to do that gives us the skills to do the ordinary into the extraordinary and to bring joy to others. And that's pretty awesome, isn't it? Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you do turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. Thank you, God, God that you give us the skills to be able to do that. Help us that we can do the same, to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary and to be able to share what you have given us with others. Thank you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us continue in prayer as we come to before God with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of mercy, hear the prayers of your thirsting people. Every time we've attributed your miracles in our lives to our own hands alone, forgive us, we pray. For every time that we promised to trust you but have turned to our own way when your response did not come soon enough or in the way that we expected, grant us mercy, O oh God. Forgive us for the many opportunities to extend forgiveness that we have refused. Show us what it means to love again, dear Lord. Forgive us for the way we put our own understandings above your wisdom for each time we resist your command to be reconciled with those who believe differently from us. Direct us in the way of peace, we pray. For our silent sins, for our quiet acts of violence, and for our indifference to the suffering around us, forgive us, loving one, and quench our thirst with your grace. Remake us into the vessels of tenderness and compassion, for Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Because of God's great love for us, we have peace and God we have peace with God and access to God's grace all through Jesus Christ, who while we were still sinners, died to free us from the bondage of sin, and so we can know that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So let us stand and sing once again. How great is our God. Beginning at the end, beginning at the end. 
Thank you, James. Our gospel reading for today comes from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. The wedding at Cana. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there, there were six stone jars with, for the jury, jury, Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, Though the servants knew who had drawn the water, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept this good wine till now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana and Galilee and revealed his glory and the disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Weddings can be fun, can't they? Such a wonderful time of celebration with the couple who have chosen to join together in holy matrimony. On most occasions, the wedding and the reception go according to schedule, thanks to the meticulous planning carried out by the two people getting married, with their family and friends assisting, of course. A wedding is a big thing to plan, and the more help the couple has, the better. But unfortunately for some couples, it doesn't always go to plan. And sometimes disaster ensues with the results being posted on the internet for all to see. Thank you, Twitter, for the awesome hashtag wedding fail. Here's a few examples. Keeping it fun tweets. The photographer at my mum's wedding backed into a candle and caught fire. My grandma shouted, honey, your hair is on fire. My grandpa thought she was alerting him, took off his toupee, threw it on the floor and stomped on it. And then there's this one from Photodog. I was photographing a wedding and the groom showed up. He looked very confused. He didn't recognise anyone. Wrong groom, wrong church, wrong date. Jackie, Jackie Drosen tried to find the brighter side of her wedding fail. The fire alarm went off during our reception. At least we got some great pictures next to the fire truck. Ellie Nuzum shared this. My four-year-old cousin was the flower girl at her aunt's wedding. Confused about her role and what she was celebrating, she sang happy birthday the whole way down the aisle. And then, of course, when words can't do the story justice, a photograph works even better. Thank you, Sarah Hay Sanders, for this one. With that much birdseed, at least the pigeons would have been happy. And then Parkview Track, thank you for sharing this photograph from your cousin's wedding reception. Wow. <laughs> yes, weddings don't always go to plan. And in our gospel passage for this week, we learn about one where there's about to be another wedding fail, for the wine was about to run out mid-celebration. So let's explore this passage to discover what it, might to reveal, what it might reveal to us about God 
and how we might respond to the gift of grace revealed to us through God's Son, Jesus. So the passage begins with Jesus, uh, with, with Jesus, his mum and his disciples all being invited to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. But as we find early in the passage, the wedding celebration is not going to plan. Now, before we jump to conclusions based on our own experiences at weddings, we need to remember that throughout the centuries and in, and in all cultures, the customs and traditions of weddings differ greatly. And so it is good to be aware of what those traditions and cultures are when comparing weddings in ancient times with the weddings that we celebrate today. But if there's one thing that does remain constant throughout history, thus allowing us to make a direct comparison, it is that the running out of refreshment, in this case wine, would have certainly put a dampener on the celebration and perhaps even cut the celebration short. And of course, this would have been disastrous. Jesus' mum hears about the situation, that they're about to run out of wine, and she, she's on to it. She tells Jesus about it, of, and in the context of her words to Jesus, she expects Jesus to do something about it. Jesus, though, appears to not want to do anything with, with him saying to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. There are a couple of things to pick up here. Jesus' words to his mum seem awfully rude to Arias, don't they? In her commentary on this passage, the biblical scholar Gail O'Day writes that Jesus' words are neither rude nor hostile. Instead, they are a formula of disengagement, thus creating a distance between Jesus and his mother by downplaying their familial relation. And when Jesus talks about his hour that has not yet come, he is referring to, of course, the event of his death and resurrection and ascension, and so in this light, why should the running out of wine at the wedding be any concern of Jesus? Jesus' mum, though, knows better, possibly with her intimate knowledge of her son, regardless of his dismissive words to her. She is his mother, after all. And so she instructs the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. So here's one lesson that we can take away from this passage. You must always obey your mums. But Jesus did that to his mum. Nearby are six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons each, and as we saw in the children's talk, but that's a lot of water or a lot of, a lot of liquid. About 70 to 110 litres. Jesus tells the servants to fill the six jars with water in which the servants fill them to the brim. Then he instructs them to draw water from the jars and take it to the chief steward to be sampled. When the steward tastes the water, which has now become wine, he seems confused, for he did not know where it was from. The steward then calls to the bridegroom and says to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have all become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. The, stewards, the steward did not know that Jesus was the one responsible for the wine and neither did the bridegroom. But Mary knew it was Jesus, and so did the servants, and the disciples knew it was him also, and of course, we know as well. So the question I'm sure that many of you are asking is, why was this the first sign that Jesus performed? Throughout his ministry, as recorded in John's Gospel, Jesus carried out seven supernatural signs, beginning with this first one of turning water into wine. Jesus then went on to heal several people who suffered from crippling and life-threatening ailments, including the royal official's son, the paralytic man on the Sabbath, and the man who was born blind. Jesus fed thousands of people with just the lunch of a small boy, a handful of fish and bread. He walked on water, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Yet when compared to healing people and feeding people and raising people from the dead, Jesus' first sign of turning water into wine seems a little frivolous, doesn't it? And so why would Jesus do it? Well, we might begin to answer this question by asking ourselves why we call these supernatural acts that Jesus did in John's Gospel not as miracles, but signs. Signs usually point us towards or alert us to something. Like a notice or a directional sign, they are not the thing in itself, but they orientate us towards the thing, make us aware of the thing. 
And in John's gospel, the signs carried out by Jesus make us aware of, point us in the direction of, orientate us towards God. And so when we study the signs that Jesus did, we are able to learn something new about, about who God is, about what God is like, and about what is important to God. For the later six signs in, in, of Jesus in John's Gospel, they reveal obvious characteristics of God, that God cares about our well-being, that God wants us to be whole, that God wants us to be fed and nourished, both physically and spiritually, that those who are considered least are important to God, that God loves and cares for all people, among many other characteristics these signs reveal. But as for Jesus' first sign, what can that teach us about God? What can Jesus turning water into wine to reveal to us about God? Does God want us to be all intoxicated? Well, according to the theologian Professor Elizabeth Johnson of the Lutheran Institute of Theology in Megana, Cameroon, the image of the wedding banquet is frequently used in scripture as a picture of the restoration of Israel and wine is frequently used as a symbol of the joy and celebration associated with salvation. Amos speaks of the day when the mountains shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it from Amos chapter 9 verse 13. Isaiah speaks of the feast that God will prepare for all peoples, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of well-aged wines strained clear from Isaiah 25 verse 6. The abundance of fine wine is a symbol of the abundance of joy that awaits not only Israel, but all peoples on the day of God's salvation. Sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? And so with this in mind, a clearer picture might begin to form for us as to the nature of God that this first sign of Jesus is pointing towards, that the abundant supply of fine wine that Jesus provides for those attending the wedding reveals to them and to us and to all people the restoration, the salvation, the life and the abundant joy that God has and will and is providing to everyone. And as if to make it even clearer, Jesus even says this himself when in chapter 10 of John's Gospel, he says that he has come that people may have life and have it abundantly. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what might this abundant life look like? In the midst of a pandemic, when the virus is spreading faster and further than we could have even imagined even a few short weeks ago, the life we are living now seems nothing like it's abundant, does it? With so much fear and worry surrounding us, how is it possible that we can live abundantly in a world that seems so dark? Well, it depends on how we define abundant life. I believe that abundant life is more than an absence of fear or worry or sadness. Abundant life is more than just trying to survive. And abundant life is far more than any excess of worldly material things that enable a life of comfort and ease that is free of struggle. No, to live abundantly is to be in relationship with Jesus, to follow him, to love him, to receive love from him. Love that he gives freely and generously in the same way that he gave the best wine to the guests at the wedding banquet. To live abundantly is to receive the grace of God, grace that sustains us when we fall short, grace that brings us hope and peace and joy and light even in the midst of struggle and sorrow and darkness. To live abundantly is to live the life that only Jesus can provide, for Jesus is the source of life, life that is rich and full and eternal and that nothing, including death itself, can take away from us. And so the first sign that Jesus demonstrates at the wedding at Cana can be looked upon as an invitation to take hold of, to embrace, to make our own the love and grace, and the life that Jesus offers us and all people. We're all invited to the wedding banquet where Jesus is the bridegroom and where he gives all of himself to us to bring us life in abundance. What more can we do except to say yes, to embrace it and to live it? Amen. And so let us respond as we sing another wonderful hymn. 
O oh God, our help in ages past. Please be seated, everyone. And our free will offering for the Lord will be received. stand as we dedicate the offering. <clears throat> Holy God, we thank you for your gift of abundant life, your gift of abundant love. We respond to your gift of love through these gifts of our own. And so we ask you to use these gifts, to multiply them, to share them, so that we can all share what we have been given with those around us, so that your love and your life may be known by all. Thank you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Please be seated. Jeff, what are we noticing today?
Uh, for those who uh, were able to uh, contribute decorations to our Christmas tree, which was, uh, was here throughout uh, December, um, the, the decorations are uh, now in a couple of boxes down at the, the door of the church. So if, if there's any of those that you contributed that you'd like to reclaim, uh, then check out the, the boxes uh, as you leave this morning. Um, for those at home, if, uh, if uh, the idea of uh, coming to worship on the veranda or in the outdoors appeals, uh, then our Sunday evening services we hold at five o'clock uh, on the veranda. Uh, so that's another option that, that's available to you at the moment. Um, there are some activities, of course, that are suspended at the moment, and uh, that includes our ladies' cuppa and chat. That won't be happening in January, and men's coffee won't be happening in January. Uh, remember, it's, um, we were able to uh, continue our support for remote villages in the Philippines uh, this year, and uh, this is always a good time of year to buy uh, back-to-school items, so like exercise books and pens and pencils, coloured pencils, etc. Uh, if you happen to be in the shops and see those items on sale, you might like to, uh, to grab some of those at the moment, and you can always bring those uh, up, to the, up to the church here um, when you come. And uh, you may have noticed that uh, next Sunday we're having a commissioning for Reverend Mary Hare as a minister in association within the, the life of our, our congregation. Um, I'm sure many of you have uh, greatly appreciated Mary's ministry amongst us over the years, particularly her pastoral care within the life of our, our congregation. And um, in re recognition of this, we, uh, the Church Council has decided that we would like to uh, appoint uh, Mary as a minister in association and um, uh, the, uh, commissioning for Mary uh, in that role uh, will be uh, part of our service next Sunday morning uh, at 8.30. So we look forward to that. And uh, also next Sunday evening um, there is the opportunity uh, for as we draw close to Australia Day uh, our service next Sunday evening will be uh, particularly a service of lament uh, and it will be an opportunity uh, for us as a congregation to reflect and lament uh, the impact of colonisation on the first peoples of this land. So that will be a focus of our service next Sunday evening. Now that particular service will be held in the church. Uh, that will be uh, next Sunday at five o'clock. We come to God in prayer for his people. Holy God of grace, we thank you for the precious gift of your beloved son Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, for the gift of eternal life with you. And rejoice in the transforming presence of Jesus and all this means to us as we grow in Christ. Loving God, we give you thanks that you have created a world of extravagant beauty for all to care for and delight in. We pray for the peoples of the world, for all in positions of authority and responsibility, for those whose lives have been devastated by war, poverty or disease, for children who have been robbed of the joy of childhood, for those who are victims of greed, violence or oppression. May we feast at your table. May we who feast at your table bring to others your wine of justice and peace. Ever abundant God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks that you welcome all to your feast of, of abundance, spreading before us your gifts of bread and wine. We pray for all who eat at your table, for your church in this and other lands, for unity in Christ as they witness to the good news. 
for all who exercise their gifts in ministry, that they will reflect God's purposes. For all who worship and minister in this parish to bear witness to your love and word. That we may be nourished to nourish others. May we feast at your table, bring to others your redemption and grace, and grace. Ever bountiful God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the communities in which we live and work. For those who are victims of prejudice, abuse and neglect. For the pain and deprivation they experience. For our families, for our friends and for ourselves. That we may all grow together in love. May we who feast at your table bring to others your wine of reconciliation and love. Ever bountiful God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we give thanks that you are infinite in compassion and tenderness, sharing the sorrows and pain of your children. We pray for all who work to alleviate the suffering of others and for those in need of healing and comfort. For those in pain, whose bodies are broken, whose minds are confused, whose spirits are sad. For the lonely, the unwanted and those who mourn. May we who feast at your table bring to others your wine of consolation and gladness. Ever abundant God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all, for, we pray for comfort and healing for all who are ill, many seriously ill or injured, for those undergoing long-term treatments and for all those caring for them for frontline workers who looked after their immediate needs. We give, thanks, we give you thanks for the gift of people who lovingly care for folk in need. We pray we never take for granted all that you provide, even in these difficult times. We pray for all who are grieving, that they may have the comfort of your loving touch and the, pe with, and the people you place around them to care for them and to love them, Lord. We, pr we offer our prayers in places where, na where nature has been harsh and people have lost loved ones, homes and livelihoods. Many may they remain in hope and have courage and healing for the future. We especially pray for your safekeeping for the people of Tonga facing the aftermath of the earthquake and the tsunami. Loving God, we give, thank, we give you thanks that in death, as in life, you welcome hope, your sons and daughters. We pray for those we love who have died, for our, your friends and lovers of every age. May we, with all who have feasted at your earthly table, be brought to your heavenly banquet to share with you the wine of eternal life. These prayers we offer in the name of Jesus, our source of life, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Mary. So let us stand and sing once more. Lord of all hopefulness.
So go now from this place, remembering that God who calls us to mission also calls us to feasting and dancing. May the one who turned water into wine turn our tedium into festival and show us how to alternate between commitment and carnival. May God's will be done here where we live and may impossible things come to pass. May we find strength in the journey and joy in the struggle through the grace of God. Amen. And let us say to one another the Mispa benediction. May the Lord watch between me and thee whilst we're absent one from the other. Amen.